So um, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, some research we've been doing on uh, neuromorphic computing architectures. Um, I'm going to, we've been looking at uh, two primary types of architectures. Um, one of them is a uh, digital one, and the other is a memristor based. Both of them are tiled in a uh, system like this, where we have um, one uh, crossbar, essentially, um, in one core. And all these cores connected together through an on-chip routing network. Um, so for this one, we have a FPGA implementation also at present. And I'll talk about that uh, later on. Um, so the bulk of this talk is going to be about the memristor-based approach uh, for building something like this. And um, I'll start off with talking about some device modeling work we did. Um, um, with, uh, when we first started looking at this a few years ago, uh, most of the device models were uh, well suited for uh, sinusoidal inputs to memristors. So they, this, these are some, this is a plot from an actual device from Boise State, uh, just cut and paste from their paper. And uh, these are some uh, different models um, that uh, were modeling some, a device sort of like this with sinusoidal inputs. So you see a fairly close match. Uh, here you see uh, another, uh, the same device um, with uh, pulsed inputs. And you notice that uh, what happens over here is that on the first pulse there's a big change in the resistance. So the top, uh, the vertical axis is current. And so you see a big increase in the current. And then subsequent pulses cause smaller changes in the current. And uh, the models that were available at that time for memristor devices had the exact opposite behavior. So when we put these in SPICE, we saw that we were getting uh, small changes in the first pulses and larger changes on subsequent pulses. Uh, so uh, that led us to uh, develop a new model. And uh, so this model matches this device uh, fairly well and also matches several other devices. Uh, another benefit of the model is it's quite scalable. So here's the model against uh, the um, body state device. This is uh, cut and paste from their paper, these two slides of uh, plots, and this is our model. Uh, you see it's fairly close. Uh, here's another one from uh, University of Michigan. So these are cut and paste plots from their paper, and this is our model for that device. So what we did was just change some of the parameter values. Um, another one from University, of, uh, sorry, from HP Labs, and this is our model for that. Um, another one from HP Labs, and then uh, one from Iowa State. So one of the benefits of our model is that it's quite scalable. Um, several of the other models we looked at would uh, cause uh, spy simulations to crash if you had more than uh, 15 or uh, 10 devices in, in your uh, crossbar array in SPICE. So with our model, we were able to go well beyond uh, 3,000 memristor devices uh, without any problems um, in, in simulation. So here's a plot that we uh, f using the Sandia Zeiss parallel SPICE simulator for our uh, memristor crossbars. And uh, what you see over here is this is with one core, two cores, and then this is uh, going over MPI through to uh, uh, two machines uh, using three cores. Uh, so we're simulating fairly large crossbar arrays over here uh, with our model without any uh, issues. So uh, next thing I want to talk about is the um, implementation of neural networks using the uh, mem uh, memristor uh, devices. Uh, here you have a memristor device, uh, sorry, um, a neural network with uh, two layers, uh, seven neurons in the first layer and two neurons in the second layer. And this is the uh, memristor crossbar uh, implementation that we have developed. So over here, we are using uh, two memristors per synapse. So this, uh, synapse, uh, or this weight over here, WA sub 1, is represented by two memristors. And I'll tell you in the next slide why we use two memristors. And, um, one of these neurons over here is represented by this uh, uh, red dotted line, or box. So over here, what you see is the first layer has seven neurons, and that's represented by these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, comparators. Uh, the second, and these fit into the um, crossbar array for the second layer. And over here, you have two, uh, two comparators to represent the um, second layer of neurons. So the reason for having um, two memristors per weight is to be able to represent negative values. So over here are, are negative weights. So uh, if the conductance of this memristor is higher, as you see in this example, uh, in this figure, then the overall pair uh, acts as a positive weight. On the other hand, if this conductance is higher, then it'll allow more current to go through, and then the overall pair acts as a negative weight, meaning 
this column of the uh, neuron array is acting as an um, uh, excitatory uh, uh, side, and this side is acting as an inhibitory side. So uh, this is the way that the uh, uh, neuron circuit is working. We have an input voltage over here, V sub A. That input voltage goes through the um, uh, memristor, and you have a current. So the current is basically the voltage times the conductance of the memristor. And that gives you essentially a multiplier in the analog domain. And the uh, total current on this uh, vertical line is going to be given by voltage times conductance plus another voltage, which is the second input over here, times the conductance associated with that, and so on. So over here, you're getting a multiply add done all in the analog domain in parallel. And so uh, you have two voltages on, uh, on the input to the comparator. And based on the comp uh, difference between these two, the output's going to be either 0 or 1 in this case. So we simulated uh, this crossbar array. Oops. We simulated this crossbar array in um, uh, SPICE, and we trained it through a MATLAB simulation, as shown over here. Um, so what MATLAB did was uh, it would feed in a set of pulses to the SPICE simulator. We'd actually send those pulses through the, through the crossbar array in SPICE, uh, measure the outputs, and then uh, send the outputs back into MATLAB. So in other words, um, Spice would say, uh, would read out the voltages over here, and then say, okay, send uh, a set of vo uh, voltages along these pulse, uh, on these uh, horizontal and vertical lines of a certain duration, and that would change some of the memristor values. So we wouldn't actually read the memristor resistances off and feed that into, Spy into MATLAB, um, um, which is so. You know, we try to keep this as close to pop, uh, as close as uh, possible to um, um, a final uh, circuit implementation. So here you see this uh, crossbar trained to recognize these two figures. Uh, so that's the X output, that's the Y output. And so X output was uh, uh, three-bit odd, par uh, odd parity, and then uh, what the Y output was another nonlinear function. And so based on that, you can see that the uh, training took about uh, 130 epochs for this um, circuit. And here's a uh, larger uh, uh, neural network being trained and uh, this took about um, 60, uh, 62 epochs. We um, have started introducing noise into our memristor device models. So we're updating our memristor device models to capture stochasticity, noise, and several other uh, features. So here's a, a preliminary result that we have of uh, uh, training a crossbar without noise in the device models. And then here is training with noise in the device models. And uh, so you see it still trains, but it takes a bit longer to converge. One of the interesting things we found from our spice simulations is that we want slow memristors as opposed to fast memristors. Um, and the main reason for that is what, you're, what we're doing in this circuit here is we're modifying each of these resistance just a little bit by sending a pulse through it, a right pulse through it. So uh, if, if the memristor device is, has a fast switching time, then we won't be able to get too many states within the device. Uh, and we would need to send in really tiny pulses to get a, uh, anything um, useful. So in other words, if the switching time of the device was 10 nanoseconds, we'd need to send in a one picosecond pulse for a fairly small uh, uh, neural network being trained. On the other hand, if the switching time was about uh, 10 microseconds, then we'd need a 10 nanosecond pulse for the same uh, neural network. So in other words, the kind of device we need is pretty much the opposite of what you want for uh, a memory device uh, or a memory uh, circuit. Um, so I think there's qu quite a bit of work to be done in this area. And in other words, developing this kind of uh, a memory circuit with this kind of characteristic as opposed to uh, you know, this kind of characteristic, these, uh, the fast devices. Um, <clears throat> so one of the other things we've started doing is looking at um, online training for this um, system. So we've looked at, um, in this talk, I'm going to tell you about how we implemented backpropagation. And uh, we didn't implement the traditional backpropagation because that would be very challenging to do, uh, especially with um, having to send uh, um, uh, you know, uh, high precision values, uh, error values between layers. So what we did was we modified the backpropagation algorithm uh, to something uh, related to backpropagation and uh, another algorithm called concurrent learning algorithm. So we kind of combined the two together. And um, it's designed primarily for the uh, uh, multi-core uh, approach that I showed you earlier, where communication is going to be um, 
you know, we want to have minimize the amount of communication between the cores. So to enable this, we used a different kind of neuron circuit in addition to the circuit I had shown you earlier. So in this neuron circuit, we have the memristor pairs. Uh, we have just a single column of memristors, but we still have a pair of memristors per weight. So in this case, we have to feed in uh, the, uh, an input and its complementary form uh, in order to get uh, the circuit to work properly. And um, so this is the uh, overall uh, approach that you see on the forward pass. So what happens in this case is the inputs come in on this side. Uh, and then you, they go, uh, your first layer output comes out over here. That output is then fed into the second layer uh, crossbar over here, and you have the output coming out. Now, uh, to enable uh, uh, back propagation, what we have is um, the, we, ha we, we attach this kind of uh, component over here, and what that does is essentially gives us the first kind of neuron I showed you with a comparator. Um, so let me get into the details of just this part to show you kind of how we are doing uh, this comparison. Now, before I get into that, uh, let me give you an idea of why we're doing uh, a circuit like this as opposed to having just two memristor crossbars, one for the forward pass and a separate one for the backward pass. Um, so there are actually two approaches that have been proposed in the literature. One is to have just a, a single memristor per uh, synaptic weight, in which case you can use the same memristor crossbar for, for both the forward and backward pass. But the problem in that case is representing negative weights. So the other approach is if you want to have two memristors per, uh, per weight, then you need to have a copy of your crossbar for the backward pass. The copy would be essentially the same set of uh, resistance values except in a transposed form. And the problem with that is making an identical copy of the resistances from one crossbar to another is very challenging, especially given the stochastic nature of, these de of the memristor devices. So in other words, if I take um, two memristor devices, or, or let's say I take the same memristor device, um, starting at the same resistance level and feed it the same input pulse, what I'll end up with on the, uh, as the final resistance will vary from time to time because of the stochastic behavior of these devices. So that makes making identical copies of two memristor crossbar, you know, of making two memristor crossbars being almost the same is very difficult. So we thought, let's just use the same memristor crossbar for both the forward and backward pass. And since we have to use two memristors per, um, per weight, we have to use a trick. So in this case, on the forward pass, we are using these weights. And you notice that the weights are represented by these two memristors. So if you look at this weight W1, it's represented by these two memristors. And so the input comes in this way, and the output goes out over here. On the backward pass, just take a look at this memristor, uh, this weight over here, W sub uh, 1. It's still the same uh, pair of memristors, but the input now comes in from the top and goes out on this side. So I'm using the same crossbar array, except I'm passing the inputs uh, uh, you know, in, in a different direction, especially, essentially transposing the inputs. And to enable this, I have to use two different kinds of neuron circuits. So this is a single column neuron circuit. That's a double column neuron circuit. And um, the outputs of this, uh, the error values produced over here are actually binary va uh, values. So we're only producing ones and zeros. And these binary values are then passed on to the uh, next uh, layer across the routing network. So we're passing only binary values. Now, to enable the, the training, what we do is we use this circuit over here. So we're actually taking analog outputs from each of these, neuron out, uh, each of these neurons. So it's not, uh, it's not that everything is based on binary values. We are, this is essentially giving us floating input values. These floating input values are then compared with um, um, uh, the um, error value we got from earlier. So the error value was actually not an error value, but it's rather a training direction. So in other words, do I change the resistance up or down per memristor is what I'm getting from these outputs. So we've simulated this in SPICE, and we've shown that it works for quite a few different uh, applications. Um, <clears throat> so let me now get into the uh, system level comparison. Um, we're going to look at this circuit, uh, or this kind of a uh, uh, tiled array. One is with the back propagation based uh, neural circuit I showed you, memristor based neural circuit. And the other is using this type of digital system. Now, in the digital system, uh, sorry, in the analog system or memristor-based system, this part in the red dotted line is what's going to get replaced by the memristor crossbar array. 
everything else stays the same except for the activation unit. So we don't have an activation unit for the analog circuit, and we're sending just binary outputs. Um, so we still have the control unit, um, and the routing is essentially the same also. Uh, so this is what we used for routing. We've actually looked at several different approaches for routing, and um, uh, you know, a static routing approach, a dynamic routing approach. We also looked at how to uh, split large uh, neurons to a uh, smaller number of neurons to make them fit into uh, multiple cores if, ne if needed, uh, as shown over here. All right, so these are some different applications we looked at. Uh, we used a, a deep learning algorithm, um, an edge detection algorithm. This is based essentially doing Sobel edge detection. Uh, a motion detection, where we're trying to detect between, uh, estimate whether that degree of motion was between 0 to 50% at increments of 5%, and uh, an optical character recognition application. And for each of these applications, we also implemented them on a uh, risk architecture. And for the risk architecture, we used the most uh, um, appropriate uh, or most efficient al uh, algorithm for the risk architecture. So for instance, for edge detection, we did not use neural networks. Instead, we used convolution kernels, uh, which is what you would normally do on a, on a risk architecture. So the risk architecture is doing convolution. The neuromorphic architecture is doing neural networks to mimic edge detection. Um, and uh, we looked at the impact of uh, precision for these applications. And uh, what we found was that, um, so uh, the first bar over here is showing what happens if we use our algorithm using sigmoid uh, activation functions and, uh, floating, and um, floating point uh, weights. The next bar is uh, thresholded activation functions as opposed to sigmoid activation functions, but uh, floating point weights. The third bar is... Um, thresholded activation functions, but 8-bit weights, and then 6-bit weights and 4-bit weights. So uh, you don't see too much of uh, error with the uh, thresholded 8-bit um, um, uh, output. So in other words, the weights represent an 8-bit form and the uh, thresholded output uh, for the neuron as opposed to sigmoid. Um, and so that's what we did on the digital implementation. On the analog implementation, um, you know, there, we don't really are, we're not really looking at the precision because the weight updates are uh, essentially in an analog form. So uh, the only thing over there is that we have the, the threshold uh, output. Okay, and um, so if the network was small, we implemented several layers on a single uh, core. If the network was big, well, then we implemented the layer across multiple cores. So here I'm showing you what happens if the, layer is, uh, if the network is fairly small. Then in that case, we put, uh, we put layer one in this part of the crossbar array, the outputs come out, go through the routing switch, are fed back into the core. Uh, those inputs come in to layer two, come out over here, and then are fed back into layer three. Now in the digital system, we have to read one row at a time and compute the outputs. Um, in the analog system, all the inputs are presented at the same time, and thus the entire crossbar array is evaluated in just a single cycle, in parallel. So that gives you a significant speed up and power reduction for the um, analog system. So here is a comparison of the digital system and the analog system for the different applications. So I'm looking at uh, a risk core here. Um, actually, this is multiple uh, risk cores. Uh, um, a neural network uh, based on the digital form, a neural network based on the memristor system. And what you notice over here is that the power, uh, I have listed the power uh, consumption for processing one set of inputs. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the energy efficiency. So you notice that the, uh, oh, about, uh, for the digital system, we see an uh, efficiency of about uh, uh, two to 6,000 times over the risk system. For the uh, memoristive system, we see uh, power efficiencies of about 200,000 times to, almost, to over a million times compared to the risk system. And the main reason for this is that the system is very fast, so it doesn't have to stay act active for very long, number one. And number two is that it does all the operations uh, uh, in analog domain, so you don't have to use expensive multiply add components. Even uh, on the digital system over here, we use just 8-bit uh, components. Um, now, these, comp these numbers over here, take the routing required into consideration also. So it's not just the core power, it's also the routing power uh, needed to get the data in and the results out of this system over here. Now, um, 
So this is, these numbers over here are uh, assuming that we, we're, we have all the inputs coming in uh, available immediately so that the um, memristive system can process everything at, and then just go to sleep. If we have some real-time requirements, meaning the data comes in at 30 frames per second, in that case, this memristive system has to, uh, cannot just go to sleep once, uh, I mean, completely go to sleep. So in that case, what you see over here is the, uh, are the power consumption. So in this case, the efficiencies are a lot less for the memristive system because it has to stay awake for a longer time. Uh, in this case, we're keeping the cores asleep, but um, the routing has to stay awake, and that is consuming a huge amount of power. Uh, as a result, you notice the efficiencies are dropping from 1.3 million over here to about 35,000 times uh, over here. Um, the uh, digital system over here is fully busy. It's never, it never has any idle time at all. Uh, sorry, the risk system is, never has any idle time. The SRAM-based system does have some idle time, and, in that, and during that idle time, we uh, put the core into a low-power state. Uh, you'll notice that the area for these systems are also fairly low. So uh, the, uh, the risk system required for 60, uh, 46 cores to keep up with the real-time requirements, and that uh, ended up being about 127 millimeters square. The neuromorphic core required only 31 cores to keep up with the real-time requirements, and uh, the main reason for this is that we can't we're not multiplexing the neurons. So we have a large uh, uh, we have to have a large number of neurons to process the, all, all the inputs, and as a result, we need to have a large number of cores. And the area over here is fairly, uh, is significantly smaller. It's about 0.08 millimeters square, as opposed to 127 millimeters square. Here's um, uh, an FPGA implementation, uh, some results from an FPGA implementation that we did uh, for the digital system. And uh, for, uh, we looked at both static and dynamic routing. The results shown over here are for dynamic routing. Um, and this is for the, um, for processing MNIST using the um, uh, character, optical character recognition application I showed you earlier. And uh, so for on the risk core, uh, the power consumption was about um, uh, 0.9 volts, uh, sorry, watts. Uh, on the FPGA, it was about 0.15 watts. But the uh, throughput was a lot higher on the FPGA. So uh, this was about one point, uh, one, uh, approximately one megapixels per second, whereas this was about 334 megapixels per second. So the megapixels per watt processed is a lot higher. You're getting about an efficiency of about 1,800 times. And this is a very small, fairly old FPGA. Um, so we're now starting to look at moving into a, a, a newer, uh, larger FPGA, and we hope to see uh, significant improvements in performance. Uh, our main work in this area has been looking at the different routing options to make sure we can get the routing as optimized as possible to keep the uh, um, overall system efficient. And uh, with that, that's the end of my talk. So I'd like to thank the sponsors, and these are some of the people who help uh, with getting this work done. Thank you.